Okay, we'll get started. Uh, so we have talked about security goals and vulnerabilities in the previous uh, class. And today's class, we are going to talk about three specific uh, autonomous systems that uh, that is simple enough for us to understand what the dynamics is, what the control strategy is, um, and how it functions. And then we will talk about the attack model. And then, of course, the goal for the rest of the semester is to able to understand how do you detect the attack and, in some cases, how do you mitigate the effects of that attack. Okay, so the first system that I wanted to talk about is a queuing system. And here is the problem. So we all watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or some other streaming service or even just Dropbox. Use Dropbox or, or OneDrive for uh, storing material. So here is what happens when you make a request. So you want to see a file, you want to watch a video, uh, you click a link, you want to watch a video, or you, uh, you want to access some file from your OneDrive. So this is what happens. There is one uh, load manager which gets the incoming request. So you have the incoming request 80, so I requested uh, I wanted to watch a movie, Godfather, and you want to watch some cat video. And so all these requests within the, this particular second uh, goes to a, 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 an entity which looks at all the incoming requests, and then it figures out which server they want to use to, to serve that request. So let me make the diagram here. So this is A1T, this is A2T, this is Q1T, this is Q2T, and this is S1T, this is S2T. And this is the server routing parallel. server routing problem. Okay, so here is the setting. Uh, so assume that this particular server is in Cleveland and this is in Sacramento or maybe like San Francisco. And this is some server sitting in, I don't know, Phoenix. Okay. So I went to Netflix, no, not Netflix. I went to YouTube and I want to watch uh, the movie Godfather and you go to YouTube and you want to watch a cat video and your friend goes to YouTube and they want to watch EC5555 lecture. So all of us are requesting different videos from YouTube.com. So all that information goes to a server in Phoenix and that server basically decides that, look, there is a request coming in to watch Godfather from Columbus, Ohio. So I should route that particular request to Cleveland there's another person from San Francisco requesting to watch a cat video. And so I'm going to route that particular request to a data center in San Francisco, and so on and so forth. So this, all this is happening within microseconds, okay? So it's happening very fast. And you can imagine so many people are watching so many videos from YouTube. Some videos are very small, like five minutes cat video. Some videos are very long, like Godfather movie, which could be a three hour long or three and a half hour long movie. So depending on the uh, request, some requests are very short, some requests are very long. Now that request comes to Phoenix and they figure out, okay, some of the request needs to go to Cleveland, some other request needs to go to San Francisco. And then those servers will start reading that data from some storage device 
and will start streaming it to your computer or to your mobile device or to your television, depending on from where you requested that video. Okay, so this is known as a parallel server routing problem. The goal for this particular, so what do you think the goal for this particular server should be? This router, I should say router, what is, what should the goal for this particular router be? Can someone, if you were the first person to build YouTube, what would you try to do at this router level? Uh -huh. and would try to match it to the exact uh, information. Right. Yeah. So you have all this information distributed over a very large area, right? So, so what is the router supposed to do? The router is supposed to, anyone else wants to try? Accuracy of distributing the requests and the speed. Distributing the effort, okay. Uh, were you also saying the same thing, distributing the effort? I was talking about uh, matching the data to the correct output, uh -huh. like the request to the correct output. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming that the correct output is there at multiple locations. So you, that's all. You just have to distribute the load. Okay. So you have to distribute the load and sometimes you want to distribute it on the basis of the geography. So for instance, Amazon has maybe like a lot of data centers in, 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 the, in the US and they have like three data centers, hyperscale data centers in Columbus, and they are building four more. So at the end of 2023, Columbus will have seven hyperscale data centers in the vicinity, okay? And that will be the case for Cleveland, that'll be the case for Cincinnati and Detroit and so on and so forth, okay? So there are lots of data centers distributed all over the area containing a lot of files and people are requesting to view those files. It could be a news website, it could be videos, it could be whatever, some, uh, some stuff that people want to watch or view or, or read or, and so on. And the router has to figure out where to route those requests, okay? And suppose, consider this situation. So any request that comes to the router the router just sends all that request to Cleveland. What's going to happen to the data center in Cleveland? Any thoughts? All the requests are going to, all the requests are going to Cleveland data center. What's going to happen to that data center? Jam. They'll be jamming, okay? So because, I mean, it's not jamming, but it just gets overwhelmed with so many requests. It's not able to fulfill the request and the user experience will be very bad. So actually the router has to make some intelligent decision about where to send these requests. And remember, some requests will take a long time, like watching a movie, which is three hours long. Some requests are going to take a very short time, like reading a New York Times article, which is probably just a few kilobytes of text data. Right, so, so depending on the request, it's going, to be, it's going to take a lot of time or it's going to take a very short amount of time to fulfill that request. So this is the first problem. This, and this system has to work at microsecond scale because we can't really spend so much time in optimizing where to send the request. So can you think of a good heuristic or a, or a reasonable heuristic to, to, for the router so that it can appropriately transfer the request to the data center, what could be a good uh, strategy for a router? What's the control policy or the decision policy? How should writer, router decide what needs to be done? So one of the simple heuristic is what is known as join the shortest queue. join the shortest queue. So this router is going to look at the queue length. So Cleveland data center has a million requests to fulfill in the next 30 seconds. And the San Francisco data center has only 5,000 requests to fulfill in the next 30 seconds. So what's the shortest queue? Well, the San Francisco queue is shortest. This is 5,000, this is 1 million. So it's going to send all the incoming requests to the San Francisco data center. 
right? So that's the join the shortest queue policy. Okay. So what is that policy supposed to do? So this is the total number of incoming requests to the router. So router has to pick A1T and A2T such that A1T plus A2T equals to AT. All of these expressions are there in your in the write-up, so you may choose to write it, you may choose not to write it because it's already there in the assignment write-up. So this is the goal for the router and the dynamics of the queue. So this is the number of uh, number of requests served. This that is S1T and S2T. So the queuing dynamics is given by QIT plus one is equal to max of QIT plus AIT minus SIT zero. Okay. So I have the queue dynamics, which basically says the number of uh, requests in the queue at time t plus one, which is at the next second or at the next 30 seconds, is equal to the number of uh, requests in the queue at the previous time, at the current time step, plus the number of new requests that have arrived. This is determined by the router. Remember, the router determines what the A1T and A2T should look like, minus the number of requests that were served at the current time, okay? So in this 30 seconds, how many requests have been served? Now, of course, uh, this is a random variable, AIT, this is a random variable because the incoming request is a random variable. We don't know how many people are going to watch what articles in the next 30 seconds. So, so it's, a, it's a random variable. And, and the number of requests served is also a random variable because some people may be asking a New York Times article which is very easy to serve. Some people may be asking like very large files like a video which is going to be a time consuming affair to serve. And some people are going to ask to do some computation, right? Like you have some complicated mathematical equation, you uploaded it to AWS website and then it's supposed to uh, do the computation and give you the result. So that's going to take even longer time. So, so depending on the situation, this SIT could be very small or it could be very large, okay? So some of the weather simulation, for instance, takes uh, several hours. Uh, some of you are taking optimization class, so you know, we, we talk a lot about the electricity market problem. So to determine how, which generator should generate how much amount of electricity, that takes three hours to compute, okay, for a specific region. So as you can see, depending on the application, this SIT could be very small or very large, okay? So the queue dynamics is determined by the initial queue length, which in most cases is going to be some small number, at, at like 12 midnight or at, at 1 a.m. And then there is the incoming request minus the requests that have already been served in the current time step. So that determines the queuing dynamics. Now the policy, remember we were talking about control design uh, stuff in the beginning of the semester. And in this particular case, there is a easy heuristic. So the policy is not determined by some solving some complicated optimization problem because you cannot really solve anything in microsecond scale. 
So what you do is you come up with a heuristic which seems to have done well in the, in the real world setting. So the, that heuristic is join the shortest queue policy where you determine AIT to be equals to AT if QIT is minimum and zero if QIT is not minimum. So QIT is minimum among all the Q lengths at that particular time. So of course the exact expression is given in the, in the write up. So you look at all the Q lengths at the current time step for all the servers and then you pick the one with the minimum. If there are two servers with the minimum Q length, you just pick one at random. And then you assign all the requests to that particular server. And zero if QIT is not minimum. That's the join the shortest queue policy. <clears throat> okay, any question on this? Yes, please. About the queue dynamics, uh, information about this dynamics is sent to the router so it can decide, right? So the router only knows the queue length, QIT. So at the beginning of time, it basically keeps track of how many, how many requests are, are sitting at this server. Requests. Uh, requests yeah. like because the length is difficult to know. Yeah. Right. So all of that, figuring all of that within microseconds is the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so people always over provision. By over provisioning, what that means is I'm just going to have a lot of capacity at various places so that uh, I don't have to do all this optimization because I need to serve. For instance, let's consider the parallel universe where everything needs to be optimized. You know, so I, I want to know how long your, how much time it's going to take for me to serve your request and then I'm going to make an appropriate decision based on that. When you submit your job, you request a movie, you're going to actually see the movie after 30 seconds. Would that be, would that be okay for you? And the answer is no, people will not use that service. And therefore, we don't see that parallel universe in our current universe, okay? Now, consider this situation. You're also taking optimization class. I submit an optimization code to AWS. AWS has no way to know how long it's going to take to finish that optimization. Or if I want to do weather simulation for the city of Columbus, uh, AWS will not know how much time it's going to take to, to, to do that. So there's a lot of uncertainty in this situation and so it's it's this just seems to work well in practice and the latency is so low because of over provisioning the latency is so low that we don't really like i want to check my email i can literally go and start checking my email it's it's going to take within microseconds for me to upload like update all my email uh, stuff so so this seems to be working well for our day-to-day -day activities any other question <clears throat> now this is not the only situation where uh, like I'm of course talking about movies and servers and whatnot, but you can imagine the similar thing will happen in autonomous vehicle as well. You have like multiple video feeds coming in, the LiDAR feed coming in, you have like GPU number one, GPU number two, maybe GPU number three, and you need to figure out, you, you are responsible for coming up with this routing policy and you need to figure out whether to send the video feed to GPU number one or GPU number two or GPU number three. So, you know, the future of vehicles, in the future vehicles, if you have lots of sensors, then the processing of that sensors also need to be determined using some of this uh, routing policies. It's inevitable because, because you don't know there is some error in this GPU, this GPU crashes, so then you have to start putting the workload on other GPUs or other computing uh, machinery on board, the, on board the vehicle. So it could happen, like in the future, if you are going to vehicle industry, it might happen that you have to do this within vehicle as well. Okay, and you will have a similar queuing dynamics. How much time did it take to, to, to process a video feed? I mean, in, in the case of vehicles, it has to happen within 100 milliseconds or maybe like 50 milliseconds. 
So you, you give the image or the video feed, and within 50 milliseconds, the GPU has to tell you, okay, there is a camera here, there is a car here, it's moving in this direction, and so on. And there is a pedestrian, there is a cat on the road, and all that stuff has to be done within 50 milliseconds. So, you know, this, you will have to deal with this even in like autonomous vehicles if you want to go into that, that uh, whole area. Okay, so the dynamics is clear. This is the policy. This is the dynamics. And now here is the attack model for this particular problem. So an adversary attacked the San Francisco server and it overloaded it in some way. And because of the overloading, but, but it sends a wrong queue information to the Phoenix guy. So it's saying that the queue length is zero, that is I'm serving all the requests very quickly. Uh, and so the router will be fooled into making a decision by sending all the, all the requests to the San Francisco server, okay? And so, of course, San Francisco server is not able to handle all those requests because it has been hacked. And because this router only requests one, one information, which is just a number, a, a natural number from San Francisco's uh, servers, so any adversary could potentially tamper that information. And that information will, fed, will be fed to the router, and the router will be fooled into making wrong decision. So that's the attack model. It's a spoofing attack, and the spoofing attack is that the queue length information that was sent to the router is, is false. So that would be the attack model in this case. Okay, and if, if this kind of situation appears, then the Netflix.com could become down or the Amazon Prime would become down and it will create a bad user experience and people will unsubscribe and they will lose millions of dollars within a few minutes or seconds of attack. So that is the problem. And the goal for the assignment uh, is to figure out whether there is an attack happening or not. So it's just an attack detection problem. And we will be using log likelihood test, which I will talk about in the subsequent week to detect the attack. Do we have the data uh, there is no data here. Uh, the data will be generated through the MATLAB file. So we have a MATLAB file that is generating a random AT, random Q1T, Q2T, S1T, and S2T. And all of that is uploaded to Carmen, so you should definitely go and check the assignment folder in the files. Uh, you don't have to start working on the assignment, but I would highly encourage you to go and start examining the MATLAB files, because there are some of the assignments require simulink, knowledge of simulink, and some of the assignments are plain MATLAB coding. So you will have to use a uh, combination of coding and simulink to, to run this uh, dynamics and collect the data. I will be, once I start covering individual uh, attacks and individual tests, then the deadlines will appear on Carmen. So for instance, uh, in the coming week, so of course this week is a break week. In the coming week, I'll talk about the log likelihood test for attack detection. And so then the deadline will be probably two weeks after that. No, I mean, whenever I teach it in the class, then it will be like one week or one and a half weeks after that. That'll be the deadline. Does that make sense? I just uploaded all of it right now so that you can, this in the break week, you can at least go and check some things out. And if there is a problem, you can come back and tell me and, and so on. OK. Any other question? All right. So that's the first problem that we wanted to uh, study uh, in this class or we'll, uh, we'll study the attack detection for this particular problem in the class. Now let's go to the second 
uh, assignment which is going to be a chemical reaction plant, a chemical plant. This is another spoofing attack that we will talk about today. So here is the setting. There are some chemicals in here. There is a steam. This is valve. there is some new chemical entering. And there is a temperature sensor. And there is a control unit which controls the valve. This is hot and this is cold steam. You can have the opposite case where you have cold water running it and you get a hot water system out and there is some chemical reaction happening and you want to cool down the, the reactor. This is the reactor. It's one of the fundamental things that happens in chemical plants. Something needs to be heated up or something needs to be cooled down. Okay, so what's happening here? There is chemical entering the reactor and there is some reaction happening within this particular reactor. There is a temperature sensing sensor that senses what the temperature of the chemicals in the reactor is and it, based on the temperature reading, there is a controller which figures out how much valve should be opened so that the hot steam can enter and increase the temperature of this reactor and then of course there will be some cold steam will then get heated up and we don't care about what happens here uh, i mean this is not our problem we just want to know that there is a hot steam coming in the valve gets opened or closed like you can open it slightly you can open it completely so it's a variable uh, flow valve and it figures out how much steam to let go inside this particular reactor so as to maintain some steady temperature. The temperature has to be within certain bounds for the reaction to be done well. Okay, that's the problem. Now there is a system model which is uh, based on transfer functions. Now I don't expect you to know transfer functions but we have done all of that in Simulink. So you don't really have to worry about what's happening in the transfer function. You will just get the data out of those transfer functions. Okay. Now there is some logic, control logic here, which figures out how much to, how much of this valve should be open depending on what the temperature here at the temperature sensor is. So there is a dynamics, there is a temperature dynamics. Here. 
here in this particular reactor. Now what is the adversary going to do? The adversary sits at this temperature sensor point and it's going to change the reading of the temperature. Okay, That's what the adversary model is. Uh, this temperature is a crucial information and I'm going to spoof that information and feed it to the controller. The controller of course will take the wrong decision of opening and closing the valve and therefore it will cause a damage to the reactor system. What would the goal of the security engineer here would be? We want to detect the attack. It's just an attack detection, not a mitigation problem. We want to detect the attack uh, on this temperature sensor. That is the problem in the assignment, which is just the attack detection problem. And we'll use a new technique called dynamic watermarking. Uh, this is a, a very fast growing active area of research, dynamic watermarking, uh, very uh, new class of algorithms. It's been developed in the past like 10 years or so. And we are going to apply dynamic watermarking algorithm to detect the attack on this particular system, this chemical reactor system. Now, we will talk about the dynamic watermarking algorithm perhaps uh, by the end of this, this month, like end of October. And then of course, this is the second assignment you will be, it'll be due somewhere in the first week of November. But you need to know MATLAB Simulink in order to be able to solve this assignment. So if you don't know MATLAB Simulink, this is the week when you want to go back and learn about MATLAB Simulink. It's not that difficult, but you can maybe look up YouTube video or something to, to, to understand uh, how to run codes on MATLAB Simulink. Now here is the question, which is not part of this assignment. So you are a security engineer for this autonomous system, and you know that this particular temperature sensor is susceptible to attack. What else are you going to do to mitigate this attack? So you have one temperature sensor attached, in this, attached to this reactor, and that is susceptible to attack. What else can you do to mitigate the impact of such an attack? Redundancy. Sorry? Redundancy? Okay, redundancy, that's a good idea. So I'm going to add one more temperature sensor and then somebody will decide what is the actual, some estimation technique will be used to determine what the actual temperature is and then that will be fed into the controller. So if one of the temperature sensor is attacked, it's not a problem you will still be able to uh, do the reliable control. So that's a good, good, good idea. But suppose all three temperature sensors are the same sensors, right? With using the same technology from the same vendor, which means all three of them are susceptible to attack at the same time because the attacker has to spend no effort in, if it can attack one of them, it can attack the rest of the two as well because they are from the same. Sorry? A different temperature sensor, like not connected, but feeding data to some. Uh, okay, sensor. very good. Yeah. Very good. So you want to isolate it. So now you don't want the three temperature sensors to be on the same network. You probably want them on separate networks so that if one network is infiltrated with a virus, the other two networks are still safe. That's an excellent design. It's a design problem. If you go to a chemical reactor and you say, hey, look, we need to separate these networks, nobody's going to listen to you. That's unfortunate, but, but, but that is right. In fact, for the car attack that I showed you, that is exactly what happened. The newer cars have separate infotainment system, which is susceptible to hack, and the engine control system. And, and they have separate networks, so if you, if you can hack the infotainment system, that's fine. You cannot really hack the rest of the powertrain because they are on a completely separate network. And there is a bridge that connects the two networks, but I think that bridge is very secure, so you can't really hack the powertrain uh, directly from hacking the infotainment system. So that's a good idea, and that's what happened in the case of, uh, in the case of vehicles, uh, but I'm not sure if a chemical plant will invest in another set of networks to, to do that. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Anything else that comes to your mind?
what else can we do to secure this system? Actually, I have seen uh, this. Uh, the, the sensors itself, it's not a transmitter. It's just hardwired to the controller. The controller is doing the communication. Right. So the, the sensors, it's either they go bad or not. Correct. Now. Correct. But the controller is also That's exposed. Right. That's right. In yeah. The network. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, in this case, we are assuming that the temperature sensor is hacked, but of course, you can also assume that the controller could be hacked, which is the next example that we'll talk about. So another idea you could try if separating them on network is not feasible is to buy temperature sensors from different vendors. So if you have vulnerability in one vendor, it will not translate into vulnerabilities for other vendors. Okay, so that's another thing you can try. The another thing you can try is use different types of physics of sensors. So one temperature sensor would be like a regular resistive sensor. So the resistance changes as a function of temperature. Other one could be an infrared sensor, right? So different physics. Third one could be, I don't know if there are some other forms of physics to detect the temperature or not. So you could use different physics in each of these sensors so that they are not susceptible to the same kind of physical attacks. So as you can see, the design challenge is actually significant in trying to mitigate the effects of attack, okay? And sometimes it costs a lot of money, sometimes it will cost very little amount of money, but it's always a concern in trying to, uh, trying to mitigate the effects of an attack, like how much is the cost going to be to come up with a mitigation strategy and what's the probability that all these major attacks can be mitigated through this particular strategy. So something to keep in mind, not part of this class, but you know, certainly part of your job when you go and start working in, a actual, uh, in an actual industry. Any other question on this? Okay. The third example is that of an autonomous vehicle let me write it on the second thing. Well, not an autonomous, um, maybe, yeah, okay, whatever, autonomous vehicle. It could be a problem even in human-driven vehicles. So you have a vehicle that's going on the road. No. This is your autonomous vehicle and there is a vehicle in front. I have become really good at driving, uh, at, at drawing. So this is the lead vehicle. And th this, everyone is going in this direction. And there is a distance D between them. And there is a velocity of the autonomous vehicle and there is a velocity of the lead vehicle. Okay, what do you think is the goal of autonomous vehicle when it's going on a road and there are vehicles in front of it? What is an obvious? Keep distance. Maintain the distance, right? Maintain the distance with respect to the vehicle in front and maintain its velocity, right? So the way to control distance is through controlling the velocity and the way to control velocity is through braking action, braking or acceleration action. So there is some accelerator here and there is some another brake here uh, in the autonomous vehicle and the algorithm has to figure out whether to accelerate or brake in order to maintain the distance with respect to the lead vehicle. Okay, so in this case the dynamics is a, is an LTI model linear time invariant 
system model. Once again, we have the transfer function for this particular dynamics and then we convert the transfer function into a, uh, a, a, a linear time invariant system model for this particular vehicle. Okay. Oh, the control model. So in this case, we are going to use optimization, all the mumbo jumbo we talked about at the beginning of the semester. So we'll use uh, uh, model predictive control. Some optimize, let me just write optimization. PI controller. So we, we will use optimization or combination of optimization and or PI controller to come up with the control strategy. And the control strategy here is to figure out how much to brake or accelerate to maintain the distance. Now here is what's going to happen. What is the attack model here? So remember that these braking and acceleration commands, they are communicated to the actual actuator on the wheels. Um, or to the engine through a communication channel. And that communication channel within the vehicle is known as what is known as a broadcast channel. So you have a bunch of wires. Let me, let me try to draw that. You have a bunch of wires and this is known as CAN bus. And you have like a whole bunch of ECUs connected to CAN bus. Let me draw a single wire to denote the CAN bus. So this is like a communication channel. Uh, it's just a bunch of wires going all over the vehicle. And there are brake, accelerator, engine. brake pads. Sensor and so on, right? So you have this communication channel that is going around the vehicle. It's a broadcast channel. There are a lot of different subsystems connected to this broadcast channel. And anyone can broadcast any information on this channel. And one of this, uh, in, in older vehicles, uh, there is something called an OBD port. OBD port in the vehicle. It's uh, right underneath the driver uh, driving wheel, uh, the steering wheel. And what the OBD port does is it, it is used for diagnostic purposes. So when your check engine light goes on, you go to the garage and somebody at the garage, some technician would plug something into the OBD port and start diagnosing, diagnosing what the problem with the vehicle is. Okay, so there are all these different uh, systems connected to this particular CAN bus. And here is the problem that we are trying to address. So one of the ECU, one of the microprocessor here is infected. It's infected with a virus. Okay. Now I'll, I'll tell you some stories about how, why this is important. But anyways, there is one ECU that is infected with a virus. And what it's going to do is it knows how the brake and the accelerator pedals communicate with the rest of the bus. And so whenever a braking command or an acceleration command is issued, this ECU will shut down that command, okay, with some probability. So that's our attack model. drop the accelerator brake command from the bus, from the CAN bus. And this has been demonstrated time and again that something like this can happen on a vehicle. Of course, getting an infected ECU 
is, is a big problem. But it's not that difficult. You know, you go to, your, go to a garage, like a local garage shop, and somebody there could put that infected ECU in your system. Not that difficult. But, but yes, you know, it may not happen remotely, but it can happen if somebody actually puts an infected ECU within your car. OK. So in this case, what the attack model is going to do is it's going to drop the packets at the actuator level. Okay, So your actuation is not going to get completed. You're pressing the brake, or the autonomous system inside the vehicle is sending commands to, to brake. But that particular command is getting dropped from the network because of the attacker. Okay, And the attacker cannot do it all the time, because if the attacker does it all the time, there are uh, one of the ways by which uh, it is handled, if one of the ECUs go bad and start flooding the network, uh, the, there will be a power manager here, which is going to cut down the power to this ECU, so that ECU shuts down and that particular ECU is not going to be useful anymore. Okay, so that can happen. So therefore, the ECU has to be strategic and it cannot send that command all the time. It can only send that command once in a while so that it's not shut down from the network. So there is some probability with respect to which the dropping of packet will happen in the CAN bus. And our goal would be to come up with a response mechanism. So of course, there is a detection part, which we'll not work on in this particular problem. We'll assume that it has already been detected that somebody is dropping the packet. There is a infected ECU, which is dropping the packets, the braking and acceleration packets within the network. So having known that, how do you change your control strategy? How do you change your optimization formulation so as to uh, still be able to maintain the distance with respect to the lead vehicle? It won't be perfect, but at least you will still maintain a distance and not just collide with the vehicle. So what this assignment is going to ask you to do is it will have the dynamics, it will have the usual control strategy, it will have the attack model, and you will have to show that in, in the case of an attack, there will be a collision between the vehicle, between the autonomous vehicle and the lead vehicle. Now, if you use the updated optimization algorithm, which is given in the, which we will teach in, which I'm going to discuss in the class, maybe like early November or mid November, um, if you use that optimization algorithm, uh, if you use the control policy coming out of that optimization algorithm, you won't see a collision in the, in the system. Okay, so that's a response algorithm. So we talked about the, the first two uh, problems were detection algorithms. The last problem is about response, coming up with a response strategy for an attack, assuming that the attack has been detected. Any question on this particular example, autonomous vehicle example? When you, when you mentioned that uh, the power will be cut off from the ECU, yes. if the, so, so the attack model's objective is to be not unnoticeable. That's, why That's right. It's sending Correct. One yeah, once, once every few minutes or once every few seconds. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Now let me tell you why uh, such a thing is, is possible. So, you know, if you go to LA, there are some garages not like, like, like car shops, where you take a, like a Toyota Corolla, and they can make changes to the engine, like some minor changes and change some of the circuits in the engine, to make it look like a, I don't know, Ferrari, you know, so it will go very fast. And they can do that, this, is, this, this kind of stuff is pretty common, um, well, I shouldn't say it's common, but there are people who can do that to your vehicle, 
Okay, it's feasible. And of course, it voids manufacturer's warranty, and you know everyone says you shouldn't do that and all that stuff. But who's going to listen to them? Who's going to listen to these authorities? So, anyways, <laughs> they go ahead and they make a lot of changes uh, to the engine. Maybe it takes like a one day or two days of work and they will convert your Toyota Corolla to a Ferrari and you can then start zooming in and out of the highway. It creates a lot of issues with the engine, the emissions goes high and there's a lot of uh, noise in the engine and all that stuff, but nobody cares. Which is why the car manufacturers are extremely unhappy about this possibility that you could have an infected ECU within the system because these car garages have the know-how of how this whole thing works and they could put an infected ECU and cause damage in, a, in, a, in the transportation network or on the road or on the highway. So the ECU would detect, okay, the speed is above 70 miles per hour, launch the attack now, so like a logic bomb. And, and then that creates a problem on the highway. So that's why manufacturers are interested in coming up with solutions that do not take too much effort but it can detect that some ECU has been changed. Now the problem is that ECU keeps getting changed once in a while in the vehicle. I have some problem, I go to a car like a Toyota showroom and they are going to figure out what the problem is and change the component. So at the end of 10 years, which is, or 20 years, which is typical lifetime of a vehicle, a lot of the internal components would change. So the manufacturers want to know how do I detect a component that has been tampered with versus a component that is genuine from Toyota or from the car manufacturer, whoever that car manufacturer is. So it's a real problem. Nobody knows what the answer is. And remember we talked about this hardware signature stuff in the previous class. So they are thinking about looking into hardware signature, but one of the problems with hardware signature is that it changes depending on the temperature, depending on the weather and so on. So in Alaska, the hardware signature is going to be different for the same component in comparison to in uh, Puerto Rico because of the change in temperature. So nobody knows what the answer to that question is. It's still an open problem. Correct. They won't be compatible. That's they right. Won't work right. That's right. So they use some technology like so, so hardware to the particular component. Very good point. So he's saying that in Apple, if you change some components, it's not going to work. Well, the problem is Apple is a completely vertically integrated company. They make everything from scratch, okay, all the way up. And when you have a vertically integrated solution, life is good. You know, it's very difficult to tamper. But uh, most of the car manufacturers, they buy one component from here, another component from there, the third component from there, integrate everything, hope that everything works fine, and then they ship it out to customers. And that's really the, where the problem lies, when you are starting. I don't think like Apple is manufacturing their cameras, they are all... Uh, I'm sure they have a very strong quality control. I'm sure they have very strong quality control, and they're not buying some, some you know, like one supplier from Europe, one supplier from China, another supplier from Taiwan and, and integrating things together. So, so Apple is well known for this. They, they make sure that everything is like extremely vertically integrated and extremely optimized. And anything goes wrong, they will detect it and they will throw an error. Uh, it's also known for, by the way, Apple apps. You can't just put any app on Apple store. They are going to do a lot of checks and balances to make sure that your app adheres to the Apple standards. But that's not the case with Android or with other operating mobile operating systems. So Apple is a completely different <laughs> company in comparison to other companies that we are familiar with. I, I think the car manufacturers also, they can detect because it's not like uh, the uh, uh, hardware signature. It's, well, it's a digital signature. I mean, if, all of these components are connected to this campus and they can communicate with the ECU. Right. They can have their digital serial number or something and they can keep track of it. But the thing is, they, uh, the car manufacturers, they cannot provide the functionality to disable the car if something is changed. Right. 
So they keep it open. Right. That's the problem. That's and yeah. People are keeping. It's keeping it's a lot of the problem. Actually, is not just a cybersecurity problem. There are business problems above it, yeah. which lends itself to a cybersecurity problem at the low level. And the low-level guy, like you as cybersecurity engineer, will say something, but the business guy sitting above you will say, look, we cannot do that because it's too costly. Yeah. Okay, and that's it. Then, then I don't know, go back and <laughs> come up with a different strategy. That is going to be your life. I mean, I can't help it, but that's what it is uh, when you work with vehicle manufacturers. I'm pretty sure the same thing will happen if you go to a wind, power pl wind farms, or if you go to a chemical plants, or if you go to an oil rig, you will have the same set of issues, and who knows how to deal with it. So anyways, uh, that's all I have. And uh, I'm going to end the class, and we can take some questions offline.